Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we uh, are going to have a very interesting talk tonight that um, I think is going to explain what's behind the uh, advertisements that you've been listening to on KUOW and uh, even watching maybe on Channel Y. There's an exciting, new, ambitious program at the University of Washington, uh, unique, uh, but it's new. And so um, we're going to have a chance to get on uh, <clears throat> the bottom floor, so to speak, and find out about it tonight, uh, and we may wind up being the best informed people in town. I hope so. Anyway, I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Spotlight on Seattle Committee. This is our fifth program of the year so far. Um, next week, we are having the head of the Downtown Association on a Tuesday evening also. And we have um, in the lined up for uh, May, uh, uh, the curator of the plant collection at the University of Washington Arboretum. Um, and then in June, uh, we'll have the city attorney. And then for a little entertainment, uh, a troupe from the Fifth Avenue Theater. So watch your alert carefully for these events. Um, the Spotlight on Seattle Committee is... Uh, you have a microphone? Yeah, it's got it. If I can, uh, maybe if I'm not uh, closer, it'll be better. The Spotlight on Seattle Committee uh, is uh, trying to provide uh, interesting and a variety of uh, speakers on topics that uh, cross a lot of different uh, areas of interest, and I hope that some of the ones that we've already uh, sponsored and the ones coming up will uh, meet that objective. Uh, I want to thank Risa, as usual, and uh, Adele Reynolds for our tech team. Um, and I'll briefly introduce, I'll briefly introduce our speaker. Uh, Artie Shaw is a Master of Public Health from Emory University who has over 10 years of experience in the field of uh, public health education and research with a variety of academic, governmental, uh, and private institutions. Um, and she now is the uh, Assistant Director for Strategic Engagement and I'm not entirely sure uh, how I can explain that title, but she may be able to, uh, for the Population Health Initiative. And I'm going to ask her to take the microphone and tell us what she's up to. Thank you, Roger. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, lovely. Just as Roger said, my name is Arthi Shah, and I work at the Population Health Initiative. And when Roger first reached out to me uh, a few months back to ask me to talk about the Population Health Initiative, he shared with me that y'all are, and I say y'all because I'm actually from the South, specifically South Carolina. I moved across country to be as far away as possible from my family. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Uh, Roger shared with me that people have heard of population health on the radio or on Channel 9. Uh, is this true? Yes. Yeah. You've heard of this? Okay, so you've seen the ads. No? Well, some yeses, some no. And uh, I'm excited to tell you about what the Population Health Initiative is. And just like Roger said, you might be a crowd who knows the most out of anybody in Seattle, 
in terms of community members because we don't do this often. So I'm really excited to be here and excited to share about the work that we're doing at the UW. So just to kind of show of hands, my first question is, how many people still work at UW? Okay, I had to ask this question before I asked how many of y'all are UW alums? Okay, graduate school. Now, how many of you, raise your hand if you worked at UW? Okay. And I've already asked you if you've heard of the Population Health Initiative, and you did, so thank you, thank you for that. I first want to dive in to more global perspectives in terms of life expectancy. So the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington created this map and shows the life expectancy of individuals, and this is when they're born, they have a date of when they're expected to die. So there is incredible disparity and discrepancy in how long somebody's gonna live in various parts of the world. So somebody who lives in Japan could live up to 88 years, whereas somebody who lives in Lesotho could live up to 55 years. And that's a huge discrepancy in terms of how long you're gonna live. Similarly, in the United States, if we just dig in a little bit deeper into our country, there's a lot of disparity that exists within the U.S. So if you see, it's concentrated a little bit more in the southeast region where there's a lower life expectancy compared to kind of the Midwest and then also the Northeast and the Southwest as well. Now, specifically in King County, IHME has done specific uh, studies that show by neighborhoods. So you can live 15 miles apart and have a 15 year life expectancy or life difference. So somebody who grew up in, let's say, uh, Laurelhurst, someone who was born there compared to somebody who was born in Auburn, there's a 15 year gap, just 15 miles apart. And that's a huge difference just within our own county. So this is where our work starts, is how do we uh, address these factors that influence overall health? And here at the UW, we don't define population health by the elimination of disease or elimination of injury, but it's really to address the overlapping factors and the intersecting factors that impact health. So this could be, uh, it could be the environment, it could be access to healthcare, access to community resources, it could be your education, or income, it could be your governance structure, what do the politics look like in particular areas, it could be socioeconomic factors, uh, it could be uh, kind of access to technology as well at the same time. How many grocery stores are in the specific neighborhood that you live in? So these are all factors that impact health. And specifically, UW defines population health by three particular pillars. And that's human health, environmental resilience, and social and economic equity. And so the University of Washington president, Anamari Kelsey, launched the Population Health Initiative in 2016 and convened the UW community from both Tacoma, Bothell, and Seattle campuses, from all the schools and colleges to come together in a more collaborative manner and in an interdisciplinary manner to talk, to talk about these large issues that exist within the world, such as homelessness, poverty, climate change, access to uh, resources, disaster response, uh, being able to create graduate students who are focused on public goods. So there's so many various um, population health issues that 
don't require just one expertise. It requires multiple lens at the table to address specific issues. We always say life is a group project. So we often encourage that amongst our researchers as well. And when President Anne-Marie Calce launched this initiative, she said, there's no reason your birthplace should determine the likely date of your death, or that your race or ethnicity should predestine you to greater suffering. And so this is where she encouraged and asked, how can we all come together? How can we work in a more collaborative manner? At UW, there's a lot of, you could say silos, or you could say cylinders of excellence that exist within UW. And oftentimes, people don't get to talk to each other because we're just a really large institution and we span three campuses. And so our specific vision at the initiative is to create a world where people live a healthy lifestyle, that where community is healthy and they are able to live in a full manner. And so we have particular approaches in the way we navigate that, and I'm going to be going into a bit more detail, but we help to incubate and bring programs to life and kind of let them spearhead forward. Uh, really to be able to make it happen faster. And I'll give you specific examples of how we speeded up some of the uh, some of the initiative work. A little bit of background in terms of how it's structured. So we have an external advisory board where there's external members uh, who uh, help govern the initiative, but there's also internal members as well. And within the internal council, we have uh, our president as our chair. Uh, our vice chair is Ali Mokdev from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. You may have heard of Ali Mokdev on the radio multiple times. He's, he's always on. And our provost and multiple faculty from various schools and colleges that spans across our three campuses um, in addition to our undergraduate and graduate student reps as well. And our executive advisory board is governed by Bill Newcomb from the World Justice Project. He chairs it. And it, there's multiple individuals from across the world who is part of our external advisory council from the institutions, foundational level, community level, um, and so on. So I'm going to now talk a little bit about our initiative work. So the first thing that our initiative is known for is our pilot program. So we provide funding to researchers to be able to investigate the research ideas that they're willing, to, they're interested in diving into. Through this, we ensure that each of the proposals that are funded, they have to have more than one team member that's from a different discipline. And we also highly encourage community members and community organizations to be part of that research team. Uh, in addition, we help provide proposal development support. So there's a lot of, a lot of times, grant writing is really difficult for people and it's hard to attain at uh, UW, extra resources at least. And so that's an area of expertise that we have that we're providing faculty, especially those who are doing larger scale funding and requesting money from NIH or S NSF, or sorry, National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation and other foundations. Uh, we also do research ourselves and provide leadership support. And so we're directly managing certain projects that we have gotten funded and creating tools and resources for the various community. And then uh, we also mentioned that it's really hard to talk to each other if there's such a huge institution and we all sit in our own cylinders of excellence. So we have created opportunities to bring those individuals together from different colleges and schools and campuses to talk about different issues. So this could be climate change, it could be uh, race and technology, disability, it could be around disaster response. Um, I'm so happy. So a little bit about outcomes and what we've done so far. We've 
funded about 149 uh, projects. And these are, again, interdisciplinary project teams who have applied for funding. And this is all since 2016. Out of those, we've had about 103 projects who engage community members at the same time. And we've had a three to one return on investment on pilot projects. So people have gone on and seeked follow-on funding and have attained it. And as a result, uh, thus far, we've seen 90 peer-reviewed uh, journal articles uh, at the same time. So this is really small font, so I'm going to talk about it instead. Um, this is a quote from Keshet Ronan, who is a UW researcher at the Department of Global Health. And he reached out to the Somali Health Board here in King County, particularly to assess the needs of what is going on in the community during the COVID-19 and what needs they had. If it wasn't for Population Health Initiative funding, they would have never reached out. And so what Keshet says, because this opportunity arised and funding was available, he had, the, he had the ability to go and provide community partner support funding and also be able to do research with them based on what they were wanting to learn about within their own community. And uh, because Population Health Initiative really encourages collaboration with community members, this was one of the only reasons it was possible. And then another example was from a professor, Greg Colburn. He is in the Department of Real Estate. He launched a COVID-related project as well. But whenever he launched it, he also was speaking with other colleagues at NYU, at uh, Hunter College in Columbia, to talk to them about what they were doing so quickly uh, when COVID first launched. And one thing that surprised his colleagues across the institution is, how did you get funding so quickly? And that really surprised them because we were able to really quickly turn our funds around so faculty members uh, with their team can go and do research and help support um, some of the grants. And Three particular areas that we supported in, uh, during the COVID time was rapid response, was helping to revitalize the community, so the economic recovery, and then also addressing uh, equity as well. So I mentioned we are very, uh, we very much support project teams to have community partners, and this is just a handful of some of the community-based partners that our researchers are working with. And just to name a few, there's Afghan Health Initiative, Casa Latina, Northwest Harvest, Kenya Medical Research Institute, Somali Health Board, and Tanzania Food and Nutrition Center. There's a whole list of them, and I didn't want to put them all on the slide, but that's just a, a few to name. And as I mentioned, we've also had peer-reviewed uh, journal articles that have been released, 90 of them thus far, and the top Journals are the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the Science of Total Environment, and the third one is Environmental Research Letters. Now, I mentioned there was a three to one ROI, return on investment, and so some of our uh, studies have re received follow-on funding. So the one from Seattle Times to assess uh, food insecurity specifically within um, King County to, to identify um, needs amongst the local food banks re received follow-on funding and are continuing their, uh, their assessment because of that. Our large-scale tropical deforestation drives for extreme uh, warming received uh, fo follow-on funding for, uh, from the Nature Conservanc Conservancy Funding Foundation and then our lethal means uh, project uh, where they're assessing the psychiatric emergency services, um, specifically the frequency and characteristic of assessment received follow-on funding from the CDC, from the Center for Disease uh, Control. And then our uh, novel approach to modeling epidemic vulnerability 
in Peru received follow-on funding as well from a large national institutes of health grant. So we're seeing that not only do we start uh, providing funds to our researchers, but we're seeing them continue on, and some of them is some of those are continuing on with population health support, and some of them are going on by themselves seeking funding as a result of what what their uh, research has founded. Other uh, secure other like institutions have. Uh, provided funding to our researchers include the Baltimore Group, the Allen Family Foundation, and I think National Science Foundation I haven't mentioned as well. So I'm going to give you an example of COVID-19 of what we did during that time. I mentioned there's three groups of grants, the Rapid Response Grants, Economic Recovery Grants, and Health Equity Grants. And we released funding for each of these topics uh, month after month. We had 21 in the rapid response, uh, 18 who were uh, focused on projects who were trying to understand and reverse the economic um, impact of COVID-19. And then we had 14 who were focused on population health equity, um, specifically partner partnering with communities of color to co-develop research uh, plans and identify needs and kind of move forward with them based on what was needed. And a lot of the findings were informed through peer-reviewed uh, publications, as well as uh, findings from various entities, um, or various different entities responded based on the findings. So various community-based organizations figured out what the results attained, and then used that information to uh, address some of the programmatic challenges they were experiencing, or guided some of the policies or plans that were in place to help uh, address uh, some of the COVID-19 impacts. Findings were also um, showcased in various communication medias, so you may have seen it in print or, or broadcast media, uh, so that's another way things were communicated from our end. Population Health Initiative also provides project leadership. So we have received funding from the Merck Foundation, and our leadership staff have been working towards developing a vaccine uh, vaccine update tool. So it's, there, it's on the right-hand side up there, where you can see the um, see the the prevalence of specific immunizations. Um, in various different countries. Uh, we also focus on research and community well-being, uh, vaccine equity, and hesitancy. Now, uh, our proposal development officer and our, and our full population health initiative team, and we're a small team, but we're quite mighty in what we do, um, have supported 69 million in uh, grant applications and 50 submissions since 2020. Uh, so we provide support to bring researchers together from different disciplines, and um, we review various different funding opportunities and help those researchers move forward in actually applying for and, sub and submitting the application for them. Um, and we focus on junior faculty members to help uplift their, um, their skill sets and help them continue to grow. And then Anamari also provides letters of support to other uh, researchers who are also support, uh, submitting proposals. Our most recent example is a proposal where we are um, developing, sharing, and evaluating community-led health equity structural interventions. And it's to create a, um, a model for uh, the University of Washington and we brought together 22 faculty and staff from different schools and colleges, eight schools and colleges specifically across the three campuses. Um, it's supposed to be the National Coordinating Center uh, for community-based uh, work. Now, we also have been a model for other institutions. So both the Florida International University and Creighton University have come to us and have seen the work that we've done and have been really intrigued to creating their own population health initiative. 
And so just about a month ago, uh, the Florida U International University came to us and visited and had a full day meeting to discuss how they could launch their own initiative in, uh, at their own institution. And same thing with Creighton University. They've been so intrigued that we've had a lot of communications to help provide support in uplifting them as well as they launch. And other ways we kind of are thinking through addressing some of the more strategic ways of addressing population health. And some are much more uh, challenging than others. One example is climate change. And so we uh, partnered with the Earth Lab at University of Washington, and back in December, they showcased and recruited uh, researchers who are doing uh, work in climate change and got about over 100 researchers who have submitted videos of lightning talks of what they're doing. And they're one minute videos. And um, at this moment in time, researchers have not come together to talk to each other from different disciplines on climate change. And so this hasn't happened yet. And one area that we found is uh, researchers are wanting funding and are wanting time and are wanting support to meet each other. And so just last week, we convened together at the Intellectual House at UW, where we brought people together. We brought people together from different schools and colleges. We also had a Tacoma representative as well. And we asked participants what they want to talk about. And we split up into various groups, people uh, moved off into different tables based on what they're interested in learning and talking about. And as, as, a, result, as a result of this, we also pr are providing funding for them to um, come together as a research team and submit a planning grant proposal. This allows for kind of that seed to connect, but also for them to continue on to uh, submit larger proposals from the initiative. And so this is just the first of our, um, our approach to figuring out how to bring people together, but something that we're starting off and people really loved it. And so we're gonna redo it again in autumn quarter because they uh, wanted to continue meeting people from uh, different disciplines and learning about what other experts are doing in this space. So kind of shifting gears and talking about more of the education focus that Population Health Initiative is doing, uh, we have about 3,000 to 4,000 students that we engage every single year. Uh, we provide undergraduate courses, uh, we provide fellowship opportunities, and a range of various educational kind of spaces that people can come together. Mostly we want to ensure that our graduate students and undergraduate students leave with the concepts of population health. Understand what it means, and so whenever they go off into their own space, they can uh, have this in mind and have this lens as they're working on various topic areas. Our first example is we partner with a group called First Year Interest Groups, and it's uh, almost like your homeroom. So if you're in high school or in middle school or whatever, there's homeroom opportunities. In undergraduate, in, in your undergrad, that's not the case usually. But there's this space where first year students have the ability to all participate in a class where they're connected to other freshmen and also learning about how, what it feels like and what they, what they can learn about being a first year student at UW. As part of that, we have integrated a group activity, a group project that is focused on population health. And so this is an opportunity where we get to uh, train the, lead, the facilitators on population health and they get to introduce the group project to their first year students, and they go off into various neighborhoods all around Seattle, and they get to investigate from their own expertise and experience the assets and barriers of various communities. 
And as a result, they get to practice in a group project that where every single student is from a different background, a different discipline, a different major. And they're working together to investigate a particular neighborhood and understand like where are the businesses? What art pieces are around? Where is the community center? What is the nearest grocery store? Are there sidewalks? Are there ramps? Are there, is it pedestrian friendly? And then also be able to look at some of the research that exists uh, through our databases online to understand how many people live in here. What does the rate that's race ethnicity look like? Uh, what is the income level? Kind of, it's, not, it's like a research project when a, uh, within their freshman year student group. Another uh, course that our university has launched is with the Office of Global Affairs. It's on sustainable development goals. And we are doing it right now, actually, uh, in the spring quarter, where we bring in researchers from different disciplines, and they get to showcase one of the 17 sustainable development goals that the UN has created. And um, yeah, we have about 55 students enrolled in that class, and we partnered with um, the Program on the Environment and Office of Global Affairs to lead that on, and I just came from that class um, just a little bit ago, so it's fresh on mine. Uh, and then this past quarter, we also taught a seminar course on um, showcasing research at the University of Washington that's focused on particularly population health. And it's a one credit course where we uh, line up all the speakers and students get to participate and also interview a researcher themselves to learn more about how they got into the field of research and get to know them to uh, kind of break the barriers of a student to faculty relationship. We have a social entrepreneurship course that we also uh, co-facilitate at the Honors College. And this is really focused on teaching students the concepts of so how social enterprises work. And so this uh, particular course dives deep into a focus with population health, but our professor is, um, is a longtime social entrepreneur himself and has worked in many different aspects, but really focused on how businesses can be birthed with the focus on really creating social, societal impact at, at its root cause. We also have a very similar fellowship program for graduate students this, um, in the summertime, and this is where we uh, work with UW researchers who are creating innovations themselves, and they are needing support to figure out uh, what the market looks like, what uh, is this a viable device or technology that can actually be launched? What does the sustainability route look like for this particular innovation? So this summer, or this summer in particular, we have about five projects that we are going to be working with UW innovator or UW investigators on on their innovation. Uh, there is one on uh, pulse oximetry, specifically to um, increase, uh, decrease racial discrepancy, um, because in the past, pulse oximeters were only focused on particular skin shapes. Can you repeat what you're talking about? Pulse yes, it was called pulse oximeters. What is it? So, uh, do you know when you go to the doctor, the doctor sometimes puts something on your finger to help measure oxygen saturation. Pulse. Pulse. Yeah, sorry. Pulse oximeter. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So usually, um, so what researchers have found is that uh, in the past, these pulse oximeters have not really provided the most accurate readings for people of darker shades of color of skin. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the UW innovations that uh, our researchers are launching. We are also working on solar technology and scaling it specifically within the U.S. because oftentimes a lot of the solar equipment is being 
brought from China, and so doing it more locally would be more environmentally um, conscious and help support our, our specific nation. Uh, another project is focused on um, creating a malaria vaccine, an intradermal malaria vaccine, specifically focused on sub-Saharan uh, African region. Uh, and then also creating a more racially, culturally responsive developmental screening for early mom and dads who are wanting to investigate to see if their, um, their child needs to do any sort of screening to understand any needs that need to be addressed. Um, oftentimes this is overlooked because uh, sometimes it can't be done at the pediatrician's office and so we're looking at where can we find other pathways where uh, parents are able to uh, do, a, do a developmental screening. And then we are also working with the Public Health Seattle King County to uh, work on understanding homelessness and migration and housing needs. And this is through our Applied Research Fellows uh, program where we uh, bring a cohort of five students to do various uh, various work in the tool that we have created and it's a lot of uh, data analysis and research and uh, creating findings and helping support the demographer and the epidemiologist at public health. Um, this past December, we were able to do a global panel on women's leadership. Um, so there, we had individuals from um, Ethiopia, from India, from one from the U.S., as well as Uganda, who were able to kind of talk about the, um, the strengths and burdens of women, and specifically in leadership positions. And then we also hosted a student uh, digital health convening where we brought students together and they were creating, um, they created small groups of teams and identified technologies that could address women's health issues. So they were, um, for, they were on a full day workshop and then they did a pitch uh, at the end of the day with uh, particular judges that attended and then they won a prize afterwards for them to continue moving forward and hoping that they would launch um, like follow-on funding and uh, work on their innovation to address the issue that they were working on. And then I'm almost getting close to time but lastly we have uh, where you, we're at we act as a front door to the university. So we are uh, helping to work towards um, collaborations with external organizations. We, uh, the UW is a huge institution. It's often hard to figure out where do you go and who do you meet? And so we oftentimes are the ones who meet with external individuals. And this image right here with President Anamari Kalse is with the Aga Khan uh, University president where they're addressing, or where they're signing a memorandum of understanding institutional agreement, but we're supporting each other in various different programmatic aspects. And we're partnering with all the sectors you can think of, both private, academic, foundations, government, industry, etc., all around the world. Now, I have a question for you. How many, have, how many of you have heard of the Hans Rosling Center for Population Health? It's a new building on 15th and 40th. I see one hand raised. Yeah, see it right there? That's the building right yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. So just one person has heard of this building? Roger's heard it? Anybody else? Well, I've seen it. I didn't know the name of it. I... Okay. Yeah, so this particular building was a gift from Bill and Melinda Gates, and uh, this new hub is named Hans Rosling Center for Population Health. It's really, it's created to bring people together. It's created to spur collaborations, to spur conversations, and it's intentionally designed in that way. And I am 
more than happy to give you a tour of this building as well if it all interests you. Uh, there's, you can see that there's like, right here, there's lots of um, open space for people to sit down, to have conversations. There's classrooms, large convening rooms. Um, there's a stairwell that goes all the way from the eighth floor down to the third floor, and it really connects, and there's a whole terrace that's up on, uh, up on the top where you can see Mount Rainier on a beautiful day, as well as the Olympics as well. Uh, here's some other images as well of the inside space. Um, there's a lot of artwork that was very intentionally picked um, to be housed here as well. Um, and it's, it's very beautiful. I'm happy to, to invite you and share this with you as well. It's at all an interest. We can organize that at the same time. Um, and then lastly, I just want to address that the Population Health Initiative is one way we are working towards uh, or our way of addressing some of the sustainable development goals that the UN has uh, launched back in 2015. Um, this is a shared blueprint for countries all around the world and this is one example of how uh, we at the UW work towards addressing some of the, some of the goals. And our three pillars very much align to all 17 of these as well. Now, I have talked for a long time, and it's your turn to ask me questions. And we have mic runners who are ready to run towards anybody who has their hands raised. Anybody? Now I'm in the way. Very simple question. What was the address of that beautiful building for people can come and learn more? Yeah, um, I don't have the address memorized, but the intersecting streets are 15th and 40th. I can get the address to you after, when I look at my phone. Why is it named after Hans Rosling? You know, that's a really good question that I wish I could answer. Um, I actually don't even, I don't know that answer. Uh, and I'll be honest with you on that. Um, I do know that Hans Rosling himself uh, worked on a lot of data projects and uh, helped to make facts come alive. So oftentimes um, we think that the world is worse off than it really is. And there's there's a book called Factfulness that Hans Rosling created. You're familiar with it. And uh, there's a whole kind of assessment at the end where people um, take it and oftentimes think that the world is worse off. But it's actually, we've made a lot of strides since decades ago. And sometimes our minds need to catch up to what the data actually says. Uh, the, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation is housed within the Hans Rosling Center for Population Health as well as um, the School of Public Health. And my greatest or best guess if I had to was that there was a committee who at, at UW who suggested this particular individual to me, but I, I don't really know the background of it. I wasn't here then. I've been working at the initiative for about two years now. They'll be ready for the next presentation. I know. I'll, I'll have to go. I'll ask. Yeah. Anybody? I would just like to say that I'm a little bit astounded by the vastness of this project. I'm trying to grasp all that you are doing. It's really quite amazing to me. Well, thank you. Yeah. We have we have matured quite a bit since 2016 and. Uh, it's very much has taken a village to do a lot of the work. So it's not just me, it's like our whole team and all of the individuals who are participating as well. So, can I ask, how do you interact with the you know, School of Public Health and uh, the Health Metrics Institute? Yeah, great question. So we 
we all work in the same building, and so we are great friends with our um, school of public health colleagues as well as IHME. Uh, our chair, our, our chief strategy officer for Population Health Initiative is actually from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, so Ali Mokdad is our uh, is part of the Population Health Initiative. And then the School of Public Health, we uh, support a lot of our faculty members uh, through pilot awards, through helping to them to support and submit grant proposals. Um, we're in great relations with them, as well as all the other schools and colleges similarly. But specifically, since those are housed in the Rosling Center, uh, we interact all the time. Yeah. And that was one of the biggest things that we were trying to come across. Is there's 18 there's eight floors in the building, and they're separated by elevators and floors. And so, one of the greatest kind of ways we want to build community within the building, um, just because we we don't want to create more silos. We want to connect with each other. So once a month, we have coffee and donuts or tea uh, with all of our colleagues from each of those units, as well as the custodians. Looks like Roger has one, and then welcome right there. Go for it. Is this a longitudinal study, and for uh, it's going to continue for how long, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. So when the initiative launched, the vision was for 25 years. With that said, it could be different based on when our next president arrives. So it, it all depends on what the trajectory is for funding and also for our vision for with our next leadership. Yeah. Okay, uh, my questions are uh, uh, two. Um, funding has come up quite a bit. <laughs> So, uh, could you describe where that funding is coming from for all of these activities uh, that you undertake? And secondly, what's the relationship between uh, the institute or the initiative and the school or uh, whatever it is of uh, global health? Got it. So. Uh your second question, the relationship between the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation and the School of Global Health, is that what you said? Okay, so the um, it's a very similar answer to what I just gave because the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, Ali Mokdad is our Chief Strategy Officer for Population Health and he sits within the Population Health Initiative as well. And we work together uh, with our research but also um, leadership as well, it's integrated. And then the uh, Department of Global Health sits under the School of Public Health, and so we're constantly interacting with uh, various faculty members um, because they, as a result, are under the School of Public Health, and they, we support them through uh, writing proposals and uh, uh, helping support funding pilot awards uh, and helping them connect with uh, other faculty members from different disciplines as well. Uh, with your other question around funding, uh, initially from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the funding came from them. That housed, um, that's where the population health building has been housed. Uh, the excess funds from creating that building were repurposed into the pilot award program. So we, uh, because of the excess funds, we created additional tiers of funding. Initially it was $50,000 for each of the project uh, teams, and there's additional match with the universities. But because there was excess funds, we decided to do three tiers of funding with that um, additional funding money. We did a tier one, two, and three. So this is being able to, the first one was to lay the foundation, so project teams who really needed support to figure out what they're gonna do. The second tier of funding is to work on, and uh, work on their particular project, it was about $50,000, and do a pilot, essentially, for their research. Their third tier of funding was scaling, so that's uh, ranging from two, 
150 to 250, 250 thousand dollars. So there's different tiers that we've created it into. Additional funding that wasn't from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations were through donors that have um, that have been anonymous, and then also we have received funding from the grants that we have submitted. A few of those are the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, the Merck Foundation, the Balmer Group, um, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Those are the top that come to mind. Yeah. See a hand back there. Is any of your work focused on international projects at yes. this point? Yes, absolutely. A lot of uh, the, when we work on international projects, we always encourage there to be a community organization uh, or some sort of entity that we're work that the researchers are working with in that particular country. And so, when these projects are launched, they're in collaboration with the international host country organization, and. Uh, I will tell you that majority of our work is more national, but about 15% is focused on global engagement. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Who's interested in having a tour? Yeah, I see a few hands. Yeah, we can definitely make that happen. Um, we can. I can work with Roger to we can figure that out. What do you mean by a course? A tour. Tour, tour. tour of the building. Tour. Yeah, tour of the building. A VIP tour of the building. I think there's one more question. Uh, would it be possible for you to post a design of this on one of our bulletin boards? If you're going to offer a tour, I think more people than just those who are in this audience might be fascinated with what you're presenting to us. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, you can that, do that. I, I think that could drum up serious interest. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can get a flyer and mm -hmm. such ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No more questions. All right. Well, my time is up. It's Roger's time. And I want to thank you all for being a fabulous audience and coming with such wise questions that I'm going to take back and learn, and then I'm going to send Roger an email, <laughs> hoping that now then you can bug him to see what the answers are. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let us uh, thank our speaker again uh, for uh, educating us about uh, this topic and about all the activities that are being conducted at the University of Washington. Um, and I hope that we'll have the opportunity to learn even more about it as time goes on. Uh, thank you all for coming. And please mark Tuesday for next week to find out about downtown. <laughs> <laughs>